Amen. And we are going to the Word of God on this morning. And I'm going to ask if you would just stand on your feet. And I'm going to ask Brother John if he would come and give me a hand on this morning. Amen. Brother John, you can come all the way up here and stand right next to me. Yep, yep, yep. You ready to preach today? All right. Amen. She's standing right next to me. Oh, okay. All right. All right. And we are going to read from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. All right. Do y'all have that? 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Amen. I'm going to read verse number one. And John is going to read verse number 15. All right. You ready? All right, John, you won't stand right here. All right, we're going to share this mic. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Amen. I have verse 1, and Brother John has verse 15. All right. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came to Jehoshaphat to battle. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen. Amen. Come on, you may be seated. Come on, let's see where the John <laughs> Amen. Amen. The battle is not yours, amen, but it belongs to God. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to share with you this passage of scripture, the events of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The events of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There is a king by the name of Jehoshaphat and he is kingdom over the southern tribes of Israel. Over the tribe of Benjamin and over the tribe of Judah. And he is a man of God. He is following after God. He is doing the right things in order to bring glory to God and to bring order to the kingdom of God. But despite his efforts to serve God, he is attacked by his enemies. Not just one nation, but several nations decide that they are going to attack him. And the first thing that I want to say to you today is that uh, just because you serve God does not mean that you are exempt from opposition. Come on and say thank you, Jesus. In fact, when you are serving God, it almost seems like you have just made a war cry against the enemy. Come on and say hallelujah. And he finds himself under attack and it looks as though the nations around him are stronger and are mightier than him. And on the surface, when you look at this in the natural, it begins to make one worrisome or one fearful. But I've come to learn when I look at the story of Jehoshaphat that it represents a pattern that we often see in Scripture. And I believe that many of you could attest to the same thing that this is not the first time where it seemed like there was more against you than was for you. Mm -hmm. It's not the first time that a king was under attack or it seemed like the people of God had all odds against them. Like the debt was stacked, like someone had intentionally made a plan to sabotage the people of God. Uh, we find this in today's story, but it is a pattern that we see happening all throughout Scripture. Because you can remember Brother Hezekiah, can't you? Brother Hezekiah shows up in the book of 2 Kings in the 18th chapter. And in that book, we find that King Hezekiah was under attack by the Assyrians. They were well outnumbered. They were well outnumbered. Class. They had no ability to defeat the enemy. 
But somebody just tell me and say, but God. But God stepped in and they began to call on the name of the Lord. And when they called on the name of the Lord, the Lord showed up in just a nick of time. And the Lord told them, listen, man, I'm going to bring you some help. And the angel of the Lord showed up and delivered them from an opponent that was stronger and mightier than they. I've just come by today to tell you that if it looks like the opposition is winning, just hold on to God. Because God has a pattern of showing up and using the weak things to confound those things which are mighty. Come on and say hallelujah. And if you don't believe me, you can just go ask Moses because Moses and the children of Israel was under a similar predicament. Where it looked as though the enemy that was opposing them was greater and stronger and mightier. It looked like Pharaoh had no reason to let the people of God go. But after a while, and by and by, God showed up and made a highway in the midst of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel miraculously exited Egypt, walking on dry ground where the ground should have been wet. But God changed the dynamics and God moved by his power and they received deliverance. And Sister Fanny peeped at my notes because in Exodus 15, once they got out, she said in Sunday school that, they, that Miriam began to sing a song. And they sang a song unto the Lord of how he had trampled the enemy and how they have gloriously triumphed. I'm just trying to tell you today that it is no surprise that your enemy and your opponent seems mightier and greater than you. In fact, it is a pattern in Scripture that God often uses in order to get the glory. You remember the story of David and Goliath, don't you? Where David was just a young boy. David was so disregarded by his own family that he was not even invited to be considered to be the next king when the prophet showed up at his house. But how many of you can testify that even when my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me up? He is indeed a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And David had this testimony that even though nobody thought much of him, God had his hand and his eye on him. And it was in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where David confronts Goliath. And Goliath looks at David and he said unto David, Am I a dog that you will come to me with sticks? I am a Philistine. And he began to curse David. But David says, Listen, you come to me with a sword and a spear. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. And the Lord was with David and David, although he was not physically stronger than his opponents, God showed up on his behalf. I'm just here today to tell somebody that's feeling discouraged and somebody that's looking at the natural elements of your situation and somehow the enemy can get into your ear and tell you that there's no way you're going to win. You just have to accept matters as they are. I just stop by today to tell you that God has a pattern of showing up for his people when all of the odds are against him. You can remember Brother Nehemiah faced a similar battle. Brother Nehemiah determined that he was going to build the walls of Jerusalem. In Nehemiah chapter 6, the Bible Bible says that it was Brother Sandalit that went to him and said if a fox were to run up on that wall it would crumble down and what he says in there is that they made us afraid they tried to weaken our hands to do the work but the Lord strengthened the people's hands because the people had a mind to work. Come on and shout glory. Don't care what you might be hearing in the public square. Don't care what what other folks' opinion are about it. I want you to know that God has a pattern of helping out his people when his people seem to be outnumbered, outweighed, and outflanked. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12, it tells us, beloved, think it 
not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. In other words, God is well acquainted with your situation and God has experience dealing with your specific type of dilemma. And what you're going through is no surprise to God. Come on and shout glory. You ought to tell somebody and just nudge them and say, it's no surprise to God. It might be a surprise to you, but it is not a surprise to God. And God has been dealing with complicated situations. God's been dealing with tumultuous situations. God has been dealing with obstinate people. God has been dealing with jealous folks and needy folks and envious folks and terrible folks for a very long time. And so your situation is not strange that you're in. It's just setting the stage for God to get some glory for his name to be made great in the earth. Come on and shout glory. Understand Peter wanted to make sure that the saints really understood that I know you're in a dilemma and he's not discounting the dilemma but he wants you to also weigh into account the fact that the Lord is on your side and so in 1 Peter chapter 5 he says be sober and be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion he walks about seeking whom he may devour and we often stop right there Elder Davis but verse number 9 says who resists steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren all about the world. Tell somebody this ain't nothing new. Your situation is not different or an anomaly to God. God knows what's going on and this is a pattern for God and God is experienced in delivering his people out of trial and out of difficulty. You ought to look at somebody. You ought to look at yourself. You ought to shake yourself. You ought to testify to yourself that I know the odds are stacked against me, but they don't know who my God is. They don't know that I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They don't know that I serve the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. They don't understand that I serve the first and the last. I know the odds are against me, but my God has a solution for the oddities of my situations. Come on and say, thank you, Jesus. And so we find that for the heart's effect, he does a couple of things when the odds are stacked against them. And the Bible says that Brother Jehoshaphat, effect. The first thing he does is he calls a fast. He begins to tell everybody, I want you to stop eating it. He puts the entire nation on a fast. Now I know what you're thinking. What does this have to do with getting deliverance? What he is telling the folks is that I want you to abstain from food. Why? Because it is a spiritual phenomenon. Because what I tell you to abstain from food, what I'm telling you to is to deny yourself, to deny your own desires, to deny what you value as important in exchange for putting God in a primary space. And so a fast is a dedicated and a devoted period of time where I am intentionally getting out of myself so that I can make sure that I am focused on the things of God. When I begin to fast, it allows me to get out of touch with the natural, but get in touch with the spiritual. I'm saying, Lord, I'm disconnecting myself from my desires, from my will, from my way, so that I can be connected to your will and your way, oh God. Isaiah 55 and 8 says, for well, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. If you want to get in touch with heaven, every now and then you got to turn your plate down. Every now and then you got to deny yourself so that heaven's power can be first. Hello, plants. Come on and 
say thank you, Jesus. We've got to understand that this allows us to disconnect from our preferences, to put God's purposes in our lives. This is why the word of God says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. When it looks like the enemy has you surrounded, and when it looks like the opposition is too strong and too mighty, the Lord is calling on his church to seek God first. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, but nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live through the faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, I put my own wills and desires to the side so that I can get God's wills and desires in my life. Because if I'm focused more on God and I'm focused on myself, then I can get everything that God has for me. Come on and shout glory. Come on and say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Matthew 16 and 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, He didn't say this to his fans. He didn't say this to his friends. He didn't even say it to his family. But he said this unto his disciples because he understood that disciples are going to have some hardships. He understood that disciples would be in the midst of fiery trials. He understood disciples would have to fight. And Jesus said, unto his disciples, if any man will come out to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Come on and shout glory if you really get it down in your spirit. The Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. If you knew what was coming, after your cross, you would have a smile across your face for the enemy intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. Talk about me as much as you please. I'm going down on bending knees. I'm going to have a little talk with Jesus. I'm going to tell him all about my struggles. He'll hear my humble pride and he will answer by. with Jesus and he will make it all right. The Bible tells us, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to your flesh, of your flesh you will reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap like the master. What are you trying to say, Pastor? I'm just trying to tell somebody, I know you're in the midst of a fiery trial. I know it feels odd and awkward, but God is calling you to disconnect from yourself and say, Jesus, I'm all in. Jesus, I'll serve you. Jesus, I'll consecrate my life. Jesus, look what you have me to do. And when you give your all to God, then you've got to access to all that God has. The word says that God has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. Come on and shout glory. And the word says be not weary in well doing for you will reap if you faint not. I know you have not seen results just yet but I want to encourage you to keep on pressing forward in the things of God. Come on and shout hallelujah. Come on and shout glory. Jehoshaphat begins to pray. The first thing he does is he disconnects from his selfish ways. He disconnects from his desires and his preferences. And then he says, Lord, here we are for you. The next thing he does, you can read about the prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5, all the way down to verse 13. He begins to pray. And when he prays, the first thing he does is he starts with identification. Tell somebody, identify him. He says, Lord, you're king over all the earth. Lord, you're strong and mighty. Lord, you got all power in your hands. I wonder if you could just identify God. I know you have identified your problem. I know you identified who's been talking about you. I know you identified who owes you some money. But if you identify God, he says, I'm still high. And lift it up. And my train still fills the temple. Lord of Lords, that he's the lion of the tribe of 
of Judah that is strong and mighty that is sick over all of the earth can identify me because when you identify God that takes you to a place of worship I'm not praising you because you're giving me a house I'm not praising you because you're giving me clothes but I'm elevating my relationship with you and if you don't do anything Lord I love you because you're saved I love you because you're glorious I love you because you're faithful I love you because you're worthy I love you because there's nobody else like you I love you Jesus because you have mercy on me I want to identify him and so what we find is he first identifies him he starts with identification but after identification he goes with the memorization because he says aren't you the same God that promised us this land and now the enemy is trying to take what you have promised Father Abraham you want to look at somebody and let them know somebody prayed for me they had me on their mind they took the time and prayed for me and God's got to answer and God's got to honor Abraham's prayer even though it was prayed generations ago God still has to keep King Jehoshaphat because Abraham prayed I don't know who I'm talking to today but there's some people living in 2024 but you're living off of prayers from 1960 because the prayers of the righteous He goes on to memorization and then he goes on to consultation. He says, Lord, we need your help. Lord, our eyes are on you. Lord, we need direction. And I want you to know that you go to consultation and God will tell you just what to do. He'll follow your footsteps. He'll direct your path. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And he steps into expectation. And the Bible says they just stood before God. The entire family, they stood before God. Men, women, boys, and girls, they stood before God. And to say, Lord, I'm waiting for you to answer. I wonder if there's anybody here today that's got the audacity to bring their family to God and say, Lord, anyway, you bless me. I'll be satisfied. Lord, I'm going to wait on thee. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to be of good courage. Lord, I need you to strengthen my heart. I'm going to hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your homes on things eternal. And hold to God's unchanging hand. He moves from consultation to expectation. Then he got the clarification. How many people know that God For this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's. Come on and shout glory. I'm trying to encourage you today that if you walk with God, if you serve God, if you disconnect from yourself and step into the presence of God, God will give you a word. He'll hold your steps. He'll tell you which way to go. God will give you a spiritual insight. He'll let you know what your enemies are up to. He won't allow the enemies to give the advantage over you. Is there anybody that can say amen? He says in the clarification, but then he says in the expiration, what do you mean, pastor? He says unto them, by this time tomorrow, glory to God, you're going to be delivered. What are you trying to say, pastor? Are you telling me that my troubles are going to go away on Monday? No, that's not what I'm telling you, but I am telling you that there is an expiration date on your trial that Jesus is the author and the finisher 
Get it! 